On the book. Our final uh, presenter, um, you mentioned uh, Three Mile Island earlier, and he was actually uh, on the Nuclear Regulatory Commission during the Three Mile Island accident. Um, he's also the former chair of the Maine and the New York Utility Commissions. Um, you know, he, he teaches energy policy at the, and law at the Vermont Law School and he's also taught at Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. Uh, he is Peter A. Bradford, and um, he has been active in the nuclear industry for many, many, many years, and he's here to share some insights with us today. Please uh, help me in uh, welcoming Peter A. Bradford. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, and my compliments to my predecessors on the panel. I don't think I've ever been on a f the fourth person on a four-person panel and discovered that I actually had pretty much the amount of time I expected uh, to have at the, when it came my uh, turn to speak. Normally, by now, I feel a little the way I feel approaching the center seat on a an airplane uh, with a long ride uh, ahead. Um, and I sort of think of the translators as being in the window seat. Uh, um, what I uh, want to do um, is to talk about and try to tie together two topics, uh, NRC experience during Three Mile Island and uh, nuclear economics as they exist today. Um, uh, and I'm trying to tie them together in substantial part to show that they are not related. Um, uh, the reason I want to do that is that a considerable part of the industry case for new reactors is built on the proposition that it's time the U.S. got over the Three Mile Island accident. So the argument goes it was overreaction at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, faintheartedness by the public, uh, Jimmy Carter in the White House that really led to the end of new nuclear construction in the U.S. in the 1980s. Um, and uh, that if we can just put that state of mind behind us, nuclear power will undergo a renaissance and resume its the stature as a, an essential pillar in the fight against climate change. Uh, the reality is, is really quite different in terms of the problems that nuclear power has had and, and why it's had them. Um, and as a starting point, let me just point out that 2013 is an important year in nuclear economic history already. Uh, no nuclear plants in the U.S. had been closed since 1998. And for most of this century, the operating plants, San Onofre among them, had been regarded as substantial economic benefits, cash cows, if you will, in uh, the regions of the country that use uh, power markets. But now, for reasons I'll come to in a bit, that's all turned around. And already uh, the Kiwani plant in Wisconsin and Crystal River in Florida have been closed for good, for somewhat different reasons, but essentially because the entities that own them considered their continued operation to be uneconomic and unprofitable. 
The economic pressures that have closed those two plants are playing out in varying degrees on the others. Uh, and they're for reasons of, in part, just that they're getting older, uh, that one by one they face expensive repairs and modifications, and Lord knows you're familiar with that. Um, the alternatives are getting cheaper, and in fact, we don't have a national policy that puts a price on greenhouse gas emissions. So the prospects for more plants closing as they get older and hit a need to make major investments is quite substantial uh, for reasons independent of uh, the compelling ones you've heard earlier today. Um, in addition, the so-called nuclear renaissance has essentially collapsed. Uh, Greg Jaxco mentioned that there are four plants under construction, but the, the industry's expectation as recently as 2009 was that there would be 31 by now. Uh, that's the number of applications for new licenses that either were in the door at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission or anticipated within a year or two. Um, and interestingly enough, this has little to do with Fukushima, even as the last nuclear industry collapse had little to do with Three Mile Island. And it's understanding that uh, economic reality that most of the rest of my talk is devoted to. Next slide. Um, but first, I do want to say a few words about Three Mile Island. In saying it, I want to acknowledge at the beginning that I'm almost embarrassed to put Three Mile Island forward on the same panel with Prime Minister Khan and his experience during uh, Fukushima because there really is little comparison in the severity of the two accidents. Um, actually, if, I want to, what I want to do is jump ahead one slide and then come back to this one. So this is uh, a highly sophisticated graph that I put together um, one uh, afternoon for my uh, law school class. But it makes a point that is perhaps helpful in understanding some of the extent of the difference between coping with Three Mile Island and coping with Fukushima. Uh, on the first two days of the accident at Three Mile Island, the NRC commissioners, and it really fell to us to do much of the federal government's accident management. Uh, unlike Prime Minister Khan, President Carter had no direct role in uh, managing the, the Three Mile Island accident. Um, but on those first two days, uh, we were going about our normal uh, business, and so were the authorities in the state of Pennsylvania and all the people who lived around the plant. Uh, this is the time during which half of the core at the Three Mile Island reactor melted, um, and uh, no one outside of the plant knew it. Uh, if anyone inside the plant understood anything like the severity of the uh, the damage that was occurring, they didn't successfully communicate it uh, to anybody else. And in fact, the full extent of the damage to the core wasn't known for five years. Uh, so a very different story than uh, the accident at, at Fukushima. Uh, on the third day, when enough radiation was released outside of the containment to uh, trigger concern in helicopters and off-site monitors around the plant, uh, the Commission first became aware that this was more serious than we had realized. Uh, and it was only on that day that we recommended to the Governor of Pennsylvania that pregnant women and children under the age of five shouldn't be within a five-mile radius of the plant. Um, as you can imagine, when a recommendation like that gets made, a lot of not-so-pregnant men and women and children over five leave the region uh, uh, 
as well. So the, the actual evacuation was much larger. Um, but in terms of the actual risk, it was much too late. By then, the danger was declining. And in fact, for the last two days of the accident, when the commission was concerned about a potential explosion from a buildup of hydrogen and oxygen in the pressure vessel, it later turned out that that could not have happened. And so the actual danger was very low. On balance, the public was probably about as scared and concerned as it should have been by the accident. But this is a rough balance in which they were much too scared in the last two days and nowhere near scared enough when the danger was greatest. Um, go, now go back to uh, the earlier slide. So we have now an accident much, much less serious than the accident uh, at Fukushima. Um, but the reaction within the U.S. government, as we'll see now, was actually much greater. And I suppose that's because the accident was in the U.S. Uh, but it involved, the Fukushima accident also involved a design widely used in the U.S. Uh, so uh, it's fair to raise the question of why the reassessments were so much less broad-based in the wake of Fukushima. The NRC responded to the Three Mile Island accident by closing all reactors of that type for several months, and it didn't issue any new construction permits or operating licenses for the next 18 months while the accident was studied, understood, and recommendations were made. Um, uh, President Carter appointed a presidential commission, the Kemeny Commission. The NRC set up its own special inquiry group, and their mandate was very broad. It wasn't just to look at the accident in terms of the regulatory structure. It was to understand the root causes of how uh, so many shortcomings could have uh, developed. Congress conducted two major investigations. The NRC came up with an extensive action plan uh, and for the first time agreed that off-site emergency planning um, had to be regulated. Uh, ironically, uh, a couple of years later, we had a petition, perhaps from this area, certainly from California, uh, urging that the emergency planning include situations in which the accident was triggered by a natural disaster so that the evacuations and other measures had to be carried out in the context of the uh, chaos of a, of a natural disaster. Uh, the NRC dismissed that petition saying essentially that that was too unlikely uh, to think about and uh, uh, of course that's a conclusion that warrants reconsideration now in light of the fact that it's actually happened. Go ahead. Um, just in passing, uh, one recommendation that came out of the Three Mile Island investigations was that the NRC needed to be more transparent and more friendly to the public, that it needed to support intervener groups by providing funding uh, and perhaps a special counsel's office to assist them through the regulatory maze. In fact, as we now know 30 years later, essentially the opposite is what has happened and intervener protections and opportunities to raise questions have been essentially eviscerated in comparison to what was available then. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. um, now contrast that history with the U.S. reaction to Fukushima, uh, you've heard Greg's description of the reviews that the NRC undertook under his leadership, and they were certainly uh, commendable within the context of investigating the accident. But if you look at the government as a whole, there are aspects of what happened at Fukushima that raise questions about 
the U.S. regulatory process that uh, cut deeper than the technical regulations. The NRC had, for example, dismissed a petition from a group of scientists asking it to review the safety of spent fuel pools. Uh, one commissioner had actually urged the staff to prepare a study attacking the, the scientists' uh, study. Um, a few years before, uh, now obviously spent fuel pool safety is an issue raised by Fukushima, and it's now receiving a good deal more attention than it received before. But no one's going back and looking at the root causes and saying, what is it about the NRC and its culture that led to the root that made it necessary to have a serious accident uh, instead of responding to the issues directly raised by the petition. No one's asking about the impact of the continuing congressional pressure on the NRC to expedite measures sought by the industry and uh, avoid the placing of undue economic burdens uh, on the industry, the impacts of that on the quality of NRC decision making. Those kinds of questions were fair game for the Kemeny Commission after Three Mile Island or for the NRC's own special inquiry group. But for some reason, 30 years later, in the face of a much more serious accident involving a, U a, a reactor in widespread use in the U.S., they aren't part of the uh, uh, the post Fukushima inquiries. Um, so I've talked already about TMI's place in nuclear mythology today. The the, uh, the industry's problems are essentially largely an overreaction to uh, to TMI, but the real problems of the industry. Lie, came from a completely different direction. It just happened that they came at about the same uh, point in time as the Three Mile Island accident. What really happened was that the electricity demand growth rate in the U.S. declined sharply starting in the late 70s, uh, largely because of higher prices and the initial implementation of energy efficiency programs. Uh, alternatives got cheaper, natural gas in the 80s, energy efficiency again. And most important of all was the emergence of competitive power procurement. And you all don't want a detailed presentation on that topic this morning. But uh, essentially, the risk, the economic risk of investing in new nuclear power was shifted from the customers to the investors by the emergence of these competitive power markets. Investors wouldn't take those risks, and that, much more than Three Mile Island, is why no new nuclear plants were undertaken in the U.S. after 1980. Uh, fast forward to uh, the last decade and the nuclear renaissance scenario that I've already talked about. Essentially, that group of 31 applications on the doorstep of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission in 2008 and 9 were the product of legislation passed by the Congress and by a few state legislatures that essentially undid the competitive power procurement of the previous 30 years and shifted the risk back from investors onto a combination of taxpayers. That was the Congress or customers. That was the state legislatures. Um, and that encouraged the nuclear industry briefly to think that a group of new reactors could be uh, undertaken. Um, and it produced that rush to uh, the NRC's doorstep. Um, but the reality is that there was no economic no fundamental economic justification for these plants. They, the renaissance was always going to consist of the number of plants that the government was willing to uh, underwrite at either taxpayer or customer expense. Um, and uh, as it's turned out, that number was nowhere near as great as had once been thought. The cost of the new plants the estimates have tripled over the last 10 years. Uh, 
And so the amount of money available in subsidies has turned out to be enough not for half a dozen or a dozen plants, uh, but for just the four that uh, are now underway. And meanwhile, the cost of the alternatives uh, efficiency is, was always low. Renewables has fallen. Gas has fallen most dramatically. And so the question arises, why bother? And the only answer the industry now has is climate change. Um, the, uh, um, it probably just pass over this one, go to the next. Uh, the essence of the excess cost problem now, new nuclear is estimated to cost on the order of 12 cents a kilowatt hour. The Department of Energy's gas price forecasts don't show natural gas rising above seven or eight cents over 20 years into the future, and they don't forecast further than that. So uh, without a, a climate change kicker in that equation, there simply is no justification for proceeding with these new plants. Um, go ahead. This, uh, I love this slide because it's not me, it's not Friends of the Earth, it's not Greenpeace. It's the Exelon Corporation, the country's la largest owner of nuclear plants, estimating where nuclear power fits in a low carbon future. And obviously we're not gonna walk down those bars today, but new nuclear is the blue bar on the far, your far right. Uh, the others are combinations of gas, renewables, efficiency, and there is one block of expanded nuclear capacity from their existing plants, but no new, uh, um, to, get to, new, to get new nuclear, you essentially have to push that blue bar to the left and bulldoze other alternatives out of the way. And that's essentially what the federal uh, tax incentives were designed to do. Um, the operating reactors uh, look somewhat different because the operating costs of nuclear are low relative to the construction costs and some of the alternatives. But those, those advantages uh, have now begun to decline as the costs of gas in particular have, have come down so much. And that's why we're starting to see these closures. Um, next slide. Uh, this uh, slide, the blue line is U.S. gas prices, and it shows you in a nutshell uh, both where they were during the years of the alleged nuclear renaissance, and it also shows where they are today and where they're projected to be for decades into the future. If you drew nuclear kilowatt hours on that chart, they'd be about where the European gas line is. Uh, and of course, the Japanese gas price is well above that, uh, which is the reason why the Japanese dilemma with regard to operating reactors is somewhat different uh, from ours. Um, but from my own experience in energy policy, uh, a gap like that is not sustainable. The real cost of the gas is closer to the U.S. price than it is to the Japanese uh, and East Asian price. And I would expect over time that that green line will come down and that the kind of pressure that exists on new nuclear and even to some extent on existing nuclear in the U.S. will come to exist elsewhere in the world as well. Not necessarily to the same extent, but uh, that's the trend. Um, uh, one uh, uh, question that I think one has to raise, uh, looking at both the U.S. experience and the Japanese experience, is the issue of what's called preemption. That is, the fact that state and local governments in the U.S. have no say in uh, the operation of nuclear plants when radio, when radiological health and safety is the issue. They have a say on the economics, but not on radiation health and safety. In Japan, my understanding is that the prefectures and the local governments do have a veto of decisions to build and to resume operation. 
and it's time i would say that to at least revisit this law which passed in the 1950s as part of a package from which the industry gained a great deal uh, whether the justifications that existed in the late 50s uh, still exist at all um, uh, go ahead um, i think we'll skip small modular uh, and go to the second Fukushima slide. Uh, so does Fukushima make a difference? Economically, I'd argue not, that the nuclear renaissance was over even before uh, the accident. But it certainly makes a difference, a huge difference, in the worldwide perception surrounding nuclear energy. Uh, uh, so many unprecedented events uh, uh, surround the Fukushima accident. The evacuation that we've already talked about, the destruction of 1% of the world's nuclear capacity on television in the explosions that uh, Arnie showed, uh, a host of other factors as well that will make it much harder for governments to vote to subsidize new nuclear to the extent that the U.S. was considering a few years ago. So yes, the Fukushima accident makes a big difference. But as with Three Mile Island, if the, when the industry starts saying in a few years, well, Fukushima is a distant memory, it happened in Japan, it wouldn't have happened here, uh, they will once again be urging the ignoring of the fundamental unfavorable economics of nuclear that uh, um, are the real reason that the, the sun is set on the Renaissance. Let me wrap up uh, in order to fit into that airplane seat um, with just a personal observation uh, of appreciation for what uh, both the Prime Minister and Chairman Jaxco have, have been through. Uh, uh, it's, it's, I remember Three Mile Island well and, and the stresses associated with it, and it was a drop in the bucket compared to uh, this accident. Um, but one personal reflection on Three Mile Island that I want to uh, broaden into a, a public policy observation as well. At that time, I was the only commissioner on the NRC who had lived within a few miles, four to be exact, of a nuclear plant, Maine Yankee, in uh, Wiscasset, Maine. Um, and as the accident unfolded, having little to contribute, nothing to contribute from a technical standpoint, uh, I found myself thinking about how to think about uh, strangers in Pennsylvania whom I didn't know at all. Uh, and the conclusion I reached was that as regulators, we ought to be thinking of them as though this was the plant that we had lived next to. We knew the people, uh, um, the uh, friends who uh, were expecting children were uh, within whatever danger there was from, uh, from the plant. Um, and that really underlay my thinking about the evacuation recommendation. Um, it would be nice to think that the people making decisions, if San Onofre is probably the furthest plant in the U.S. from Washington, D.C., if not it's one of the top two or three, uh, approach their responsibilities as though it was their friends and neighbors who lived around each, uh, each reactor site. And it's not impossible that the criteria used in appointing NRC commissioners could include that those people had demonstrated in their past public lives some level of appreciation for protecting the public interest in regulatory decision making. Um, That's a perspective you could urge on the senators who will be doing the voting and on the president, for that matter, who will be doing the appointing. Because with a few exceptions, one of whom is, is sitting here uh, uh, today, the appointees to the NRC in the now 30 years since I left have, whatever their technical merit, not generally reflected that quality.
Thank you. Yeah.